Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right. Hello, everyone. Today we are hosting Dominic Berry from Macquarie University from Down Under. He is a uh, Australian Research Council Future Fellow at Macquarie, working on quantum information and metrology um, and uh, um, quantum optics. Uh, today he will uh, tell us about progress in uh, quantum Hamiltonian simulation. Without further ado, Dominic Berry. Okay, thank you. So I have two parts to this talk. and. Uh, first part is looking at some brand new work on, um, on doing compression of trotterization for Hamiltonian simulation, which is actually giving us some um, speed ups which people have been uh, trying to get for a, a few years unsuccessfully. And then our second part is some slightly older work, which was just published last year, but that is on using quantum walks for Hamiltonian simulation. And that does outperform the newer work in some ways, but the newer work outperforms that in other ways. So um, the, with this, um, I encourage everyone to um, ask questions uh, um, the, at any time during the talk, because um, they uh, don't want people to be just sitting there and not understanding things, and I'd rather not get to the end of the talk than have everyone uh, be bored. Okay, so just for the very Simple introductory stuff, the, uh, the, so quantum the, um, the computing was originally coming from the idea of Feynman that you could use quantum systems to simulate other quantum systems and you would just be thinking of having some physical system which would be encoding on a different system in a quantum computer and it, then you would be trying to have evolution in your system, in your state of your quantum computer which would be mirroring what the actual evolution was in the physical system you were trying to simulate. So essentially that's the type of thing that we're looking at. And the, uh, there's two different scenarios which people have looked at for this. First of all was the scenario by Lloyd which was that you are given, you're looking at some system which is a tensor product of very uh, small, uh, of relatively small systems, so the tensor product of qubits or um, the systems with limited dimension. And then in a quantum systems, typically the Hamiltonian isn't some global thing over the entire system. It's going to be a sum of interaction Hamiltonians, which are just interacting the, um, between the two particles or two subsystems. And what you get then is you get a Hamiltonian, which is a sum of terms, and then these individual terms are things which are going to be easy to simulate. Now, an alternative scenario which has been looked at is that you have a Hamiltonian which is sparse. And the idea there is that, well, if you had a Hamiltonian which is a sum of terms like this, it would automatically be sparse. But then you could imagine that you don't have something which is given to you in a nice form like that. You have something where if you're given a row number, you can calculate where the non-zero elements are in that row of the matrix, but if you, the, um, the, but the, um, the, you don't the, the already know how to actually express it as a sum. And this is essentially the sparse Hamiltonian simulation problem, which is you can use for more physical simulation problems, but you can also use it for using Hamiltonian simulation as a basis for other algorithms. So people have looked at this for things like um, the Harrow, Hassidim and Lloyd work on solving linear systems. Okay, so in the standard methods, uh, um, going back to um, Seth Lloyd's work in 96, you have your Hamiltonian, which is a sum of terms, and these individual Hamiltonians, the HKs, are limited dimension interaction Hamiltonians. And then for a short time, you can if, uh, express the evolution like this, so it's just a product of the evolutions under those individual Hamiltonians. And then for long times, you just divide it up into R intervals, and you want to choose the R in order to make that overall error small. Whereas if you just did this on the entire time, then the error would become large for larger T. 
So for the sparse Hamiltonian simulation, you're thinking of something like this example here. So in this example, we have no more than two elements in each uh, column and correspondingly in each row. And of course, it's emission. So you have the, um, an element there corresponding to a complex conjugate there. So then we, um, you would be describing, you, you would imagine that there would be some way you could calculate given a column number where the non-zero elements were and what their values were. So you would describe this by an oracle and say that you were given a JK for a, a uh, row and column number, for example, and some ancilla state, and then it's putting the value of that matrix element into that ancilla. And then you would be using that to uh, try to get your simulation. So to give you some um, the, the quick overview of various techniques for doing this. So the original proposal by, was by Aronov and Tushmer back in 2003, which was for decomposing, well, that should read one sparse Hamiltonians actually there, the, the decomposing the Hamiltonian into uh, one sparse Hamiltonians. And then um, the, 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 some work by me and, um, and the Richard Cleave and some other people was working on improved decomposition techniques, which are more efficient. And uh, Andrew uh, Childs uh, uh, has also improved on that further. And the other thing which we want to improve is the scaling, the scaling of the complexity in terms of the overall time of the simulation. And for that, you can use higher order decomposition formulae rather than just a standard Trotter formula. So, um, so these are given they, 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 these uh, arbitrary order ones were uh, originally given by Suzuki in the 90s and then we were looking at applying this to the quantum simulation paper back in 2007. Yeah? What is one sparse or two sparse? Oh, okay. So two, th this is actually two sparse because it has un no more than two non-zero elements in any row or column. So the one sparse is just breaking it up so you have just one non-zero element in any row or column. So I should, okay, so. Um, uh, you're breaking things up as a sum of those then? Yeah, into a sum. And that can always be done, of course. Yes, it can always be done, but if you're, all you're given is some the algorithm, the yeah. algorithm given the row positions of things in a given row, then it's kind of uh, tricky yeah. to do that in yeah. a coherent way. And you, and you would imagine that if you have, say, D non-zero elements in any column, then you could just break it up into a sum of D, one sparse Hamiltonians, but that turns out to be very, very tricky and we'd have no way of doing that coherently on a quantum computer. And the best we can actually do is a D squared and this work by Andrew and Andrew Childs and Robin Cathari was actually breaking Hamiltonians up into order D, the, um, the the Hamiltonians, but, and these Hamiltonians were efficiently simulatable, but they weren't actually one sparse. So we still don't have anything, any way of systematically breaking up into less than order d squared one sparse Hamiltonians. What was there a d? Oh, the d was the number of non-zero elements in a row or column. Like the maximum which occurs naturally, and that's how they break. Yeah, yeah, so just looking at what the maximum is in the original Hamiltonian. Okay, so, so Hamiltonian simulation, of course, is going by this formula, and there's a number of quantities which we're going to be talking about here. So um, I've already mentioned we have the time of evolution under the Hamiltonian. We also have the sparseness. Another important thing is the epsilon, which is the allowable error in the simulation. So one uh, the problem with a lot of the earlier algorithms was actually they were scaling polynomially in epsilon. And the, uh, ideally, we'd want algorithms which are scaling polynomially in the log of 1 over epsilon, which would allow you to do accurate simulations far more quickly. And that's what we're actually achieving with uh, th this new approach. We also have another couple of things. There's the uh, norm of the Hamiltonian to be simulated. And typically, the norm of the Hamiltonian is pairs up with the time because you can just rescale the Hamiltonian the, the time to give you the same problem. And there's, you can also look at time-dependent Hamiltonians, which I've indicated there, 
And then you have the norm of the, the um, time derivative of the Hamiltonian becomes something important. And you can also be looking at norms of higher order derivatives as well, but I won't really be getting into that in this talk. And there's also the dimension of the system, which I won't really be looking at scaling in that in this talk, just for simplicity. Okay, so as I was saying before, the, in the standard methods, you always get scaling its polynomial in the allowable er error. And also, if you're using these trotterization approaches for time-dependent Hamiltonians, you get a result that depends heavily on the derivatives of the Hamiltonian. So if you have a rapidly changing Hamiltonian, it's going to be inefficient. Also, so yep. The, it, this is scaling of the complexity. So I'm thinking of the really the number of Oracle calls to the Hamiltonian. So you could actually quantify the complexity in two things. One is the number of Oracle calls to the Hamiltonian, and the other is the number of additional gates. And really, uh, you want uh, both, it, want it to be efficient in both of those things. Yeah. I'm still worried about this D. Suppose yeah. you have in each column at most three. Yeah. But some rows. No, no. This is this is uh, Hermitian. So it if you take the transpose complex conjugate, it's the same thing. So it's always going to be the maximum in each, so same maximum in the rows as it, it rows as it is in the columns. That's what yeah. the So you want always take the maximum of both. Yeah, yeah. If it just well, it's the same. It's always the same. Yeah. Though you can also look at um, a slightly different problem, which will give you where, where you are looking at um, the. You can also look at things like unitary implementation, which I will have right at the end of this, so I mightn't have time to talk about it, but there you have to worry about the sparseness in both directions. Okay, so, um, yeah, yeah, so getting back to here, we ha it, uh, have a scaling which is always superlinear in T when we do these um, trotterization approaches, whereas the lower bound uh, um, is actually strictly linear scaling in T. And also, the scaling is, a, is at best D cubed in the sparseness, and that's using at the scheme of Andrew, and, uh, Andrew Childs, and uh, Kathari. So, he, um, what do you mean lower bound is linear? Lower bound from what? The, the, the complexity of the simulation. Uh -huh. So, essentially, it's telling you that you can't. If a system is evolving over time t, you can't simulate the evolution of it in with complexity that's less than linear in t. Oh, yeah. So. And what does it mean scaling the best d third g cube? What, what does it mean? Well, it's again the scaling in the number of oracle calls and. I see. Yeah, yeah. Number of oracle calls. Okay. But what does it mean at best? What is the worst? Um, well, at worst is, is infinity if you don't have, the, don't have an algorithm. <laughs> right, if, if I do have one, uh, will k cannot be exponential in the... Well, we, well, well, if we go back to these ones, ours is going as d, um, d to the power of 4 plus a 1 on 2k, I think, and uh, so it's effectively d, d to the 4th, and theirs goes like d cubed. Yeah, and if you want to know what the lower bound is, then the lower bound is actually root d, which is um, because if you can simulate, if, if you're thinking of having a, a um, problem which is encoding a search problem, then the lower bound on the complexity of search means that you can't solve it in less than root d. Okay, so... These are two distinct areas. So this first one is the, um, these things are improved by the first um, the algorithm which I'll be talking about. That's the new one. And these second, the pair of things are improved by the quantum walks approach, which is in the second half of the talk. Are you assuming some bound of the condition number of each here? Um, no, we don't have any dependence on condition number at all. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm afraid to lose you. So at best means in the worst case. D, th D cube is the, the worst case. 
the um, best which you can reach in the worst case, right? Essentially, yes. <laughs> so if you have, have an artificially simple problem, then you can solve it more easily. But the only, but any algorithm which is going to be solving, the, uh, looking at solving all problems, there's going to be at least one problem which is going to be uh, order D. So I wanted to contrast the, the worst case with, say, average case. Sorry? With average case, because when you go... Well, I think in, walk, in, for these types of things, the average case is actually basically the same as the worst case. And... Okay. The, um, but a, we have a slight different thing with the second algorithm because with the second algorithm we can actually prove that we have scaling at worst as d to the two-thirds but for any realistic problem it goes like um, it, it virtually root d and it's just that we can't rule out really really pathological examples where it would be going like d to the two-thirds but this D cubed scaling isn't like that. It's like you expect pretty much everything to be going, scaling like that. Okay, so this is the first algorithm. It's uh, um, calling this polylog Hamiltonian simulation because we get simulation which is linear in some things in the time, for example, and then it has a polylog factor which is the, um, basically all the other param the parameters which I was talking about. So the the, um, to go into the known results in a little bit more detail, um, so our result was that it's, we can decompose the sparse Hamiltonian into order d squared one sparse Hamiltonians and we have a complexity which is, so this log star is essentially, if you're starting with n, you look at how many times you have to take log to get down to, e, um, e, e, down to two or three or something like that. And, if you're looking at any sensible number, it's no more than no more than five or something or so. So it's, you can really imagine that that's constant. Uh, we can improve that to order d, um, and I should have corrected this. This isn't that actually one sparse Hamiltonians. It's efficiently efficiently simulated Hamiltonians, but then there's an additional cost of complexity linear in d, and that's the Childs and Cothari paper. Then. If we look at using the arbitrary order the, um, product formula, and actually called Lee Trotter Suzuki formula, we get a, a norm of h times t to the power of 1 plus 1 on 2k, and that k is like the order of this product formula. And then the scaling in terms of the allowable error is like a 1 on epsilon to the 1 on 2k. So for large k, you can make this a small power of epsilon, but you can't make it logarithmic in 1 on epsilon. Uh, and so this is um, actually the, summarising the result in the second part of the talk, which is that we, we can use quantum walks, which gives us strictly linear scaling in the norm of H and T, but then that makes the scaling in the error worse. Then if we're looking at time-dependent Hamiltonians, then we get a similar scaling as this, except we now have dependence on all the derivatives of the Hamiltonian, well, up to two kth order derivative and derivatives of the Hamiltonian, I think, in here. Just for completeness, what's the definition of the norm of H here? Um, so, if I remember correctly, this is like the two norm. So, if you're thinking of a two norm of the state and it's multiplying the Hamiltonian by the state, it's the largest factor by which the norm of the state can be increased. Okay. Or if you're looking at um, eigenvalues, yeah. it's... Um, the square of the largest eigenvalue. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, hang on. I didn't believe. The norm, of the, max, the norm of the maximum eigenvalue. You don't have, it, have a square factor in there. Okay. There's various norms, so I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah. But, but the, the important thing is that the norm is actually linear in H, so you multiply that multiply h by a constant factor and that norm goes up by a constant factor. Okay, so then another thing is that if we, th there's another algorithm which was proposed by Dave Pullen and co-workers back in 2011, which was for, was for time-dependent Hamiltonians, which actually managed to get rid of, entirely rid of the dependence on the derivatives of the Hamiltonian, but then it had 
much worse scaling in epsilon. I think that was on at like one on epsilon cubed, eh, sorry, one on epsilon squared in that case. And it also had worse scaling in the H and T. Okay, so for the new the, uh, algorithm we have here, we have scaling that goes like the norm of H and T, which is like a lower bound. So you have to at least have that scale. And we also have a D squared, which is improving on the D cubed, which was the best before, with, um, except in the case of the quantum walk approach. And then it's polylog in everything else. So the polylog scaling in the error has never been achieved before. Uh, and it's also, you also have polylog dependence on the derivative of the Hamiltonian. So unlike the earlier approach, which had, um, well, it had poor scaling in epsilon, but no dependence on the derivative. We have some dependence on the derivative, but it's only on the log of it. And the scaling in norm of H and T is the um, linear up to the poly polylog factor. And the only time that's been bettered before is with our algorithm, which had the actually worse scaling in epsilon. Okay, so to give you the method for this, this is essentially based on a trotterization. So, uh, well, first of all, we want to decompose the Hamiltonian into one sparse Hamiltonians. Second thing to do is to decompose those Hamiltonians into a sum with, with the equal weightings of self-inverse Hamiltonians. And then we can use a just a simple Lee Trotter expansion of the evolution into a product of evolutions under those self inverse Hamiltonians. Then we uh, have a method in an earlier paper for using, um, a, using a, some control qubits to turn this Trotter. So, th this part, don't worry about so much about what this part means. I'm going to explain this in detail. Um, they turned the Trotter decomposition to essentially discrete steps at super, superposition of times. And then we're using a method which we just have in this recent archive paper for performing efficient measurements on these control qubits. So don't worry too much if you don't understand what these things mean. I'm going to explain them. Okay, so the first part is the decomposition into... Yeah? Yes, like which, which point, which, which uh, uh, item here is your secret source? source? Uh, well, probably I'd say this one because it's this decomposing into a sum of self inverse Hamiltonians. Right. So people had looked at a few different approaches before and, um, and sort of couldn't work out how to um, get a, the Hamiltonian into a sum of things which you could. Apply the apply the rest of the recipe to, so this this is what makes it all work. Okay, so just going into the I so I think I've probably explained most of this before. We have this matrix for representing the Hamiltonian. In this case, it has no more than two elements in any row or column, and what you want to do is decompose it into two. Well, in, in general, you'd have to decompose it into six d squared parts if you're using the general recipe on a quantum computer. But just doing it by eye, you can break it into these yellow parts and blue parts, and each diff different colour um, is the corresponding to a Hamiltonian, which is one sparse. So it only has one element in each row or column. So then that, well, that's just, you can just use that scheme from the old paper there. Then the next step is to break these one sparse Hamiltonians into self inverse Hamiltonians. So this is, this is the um, trick that makes it all work. Yeah? But what is there any guarantee? When, when can you split into two? Well, when I've um, worked out a special example to give in presentations. <laughs> 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 Uh, okay, so this is, this is just for illustration. I was saying, in, in general, you'd have to do it into 6D squared parts. Yeah. Okay, so now I've greyed out what was the yellow ones here in this slide, and then I'm thinking of breaking these coloured ones up further. Um, so uh, what I'm... And I've... Oh, okay, so... This one, which is a very light red, is the 
there's what I'm calling the X component, and um, that is essentially things which are uh, off the diagonal and real. And if you think of like an X poly matrix, then that's like a ones on the cross diagonal. So essentially, if you're looking at the two dimensional subspace, which is like composed of the points on those row and column numbers, then this is proportional to an X. And similarly, with the um, green ones here, that is things which are off diagonal and imaginary. So the, that is essentially things which are proportional to uh, sigma y on that the subspace. And similarly with the z is just things on the diagonal. So the general idea is that we're then going to want to say that, well, if we, if we just looked at this one on its own, then that would be, we, we could say that's like a minus root 3 times an x, and the x is self-inverse. But the problem is that we're not going to get things which in the different two-dimensional subspaces which all have the same multiplying factor. So if you look at this, for example, you have a root 2 times i here and an i here. And if they were both i, then they'd, you could just have an i type, you could just have something self-inverse there, but that root 2 um, makes it uh, not work. So just have so this is just summarizing what I've just said so I think I'll just skip to the next slide so now what I'm showing is just these two elements which are the X ones so now what we want to do is decompose these into uh, components of the same magnitude so Ideally, uh, in practice, this epsilon h would be something very small, like the 10 to the minus 10 or something, so that you can accurately approximate the entries. But here I'm just taking it to be one quarter for illustration. So to get accur accuracy one quarter, you break it up into things of magnitude two times one quarter or one half. So a minus one third you can approximate as a minus a half, minus a half, minus a half. And then if you're thinking of allowing things up to magnitude of two, you'd the, um, just did put in a plus zero. So then you're thinking of um, having this part going into a Hamiltonian, this part going into another Hamiltonian, this, et cetera. So you're breaking it up further into Hamiltonians, each with equal magnitude. So here I'm just thinking of, say, taking the second component. So then we're just looking at a minus one half in these entries and you just ignore everything else which is greyed out. So then if you, if you are just looking at these, then you have a bit of a problem because you have things which are minus a half and you'd have also in general have to have things which were plus a half in there as well, but you'd also have to have zeros because you can't have the um, zeros to have a self-inverse matrix. So what we want to do is to break it up further and say whenever it's a plus a half, we say that's a plus a quarter, plus a quarter. If it's a minus a half, it's a minus a quarter, minus a quarter. And a zero, we just match a plus a quarter with a minus a quarter. So then we're going from two eigenvalues to, sorry, three eigenvalues to two eigenvalues. So we have something proportional to a plus a minus one, which is what we need for a self-inverse matrix. So in this example, I'm just say, taking the first component and say we're going to the, uh, look at the, the uh, one which is a minus a quarter for these. And then we have a whole lot of rows and columns with just zero in them. So we can just fill in with, um, with one quarters on the diagonal. And so then I'm indicating here sort of the, as with subscripts, the Hamiltonians are breaking things into and I'm calling it a plus there to take the first component and from mi the minus component you'd take that minus quarters on the diagonal. So then if you then take that, so that remember that one quarter was the epsilon h, if you take that out you have the epsilon h times a one sparse matrix. And so you've broken up, when that epsilon h is small you've broken up your Hamiltonian 
with a good accuracy into just the sum of one sparse matrices. So, so in general, I mean, do you need log uh, of the precision matrices here or something? Well, or just, you, the, or just three the, or four. No, no, no. This, this epsilon h is going to be something tiny. Yeah. Yeah. So you're breaking it up into an enormous number of self-inverse matrices, which yeah, seems the, totally the is totally counterintuitive. How big is the enormous? Is, huh? it, is it log in one over epsilon? Is well, no, it's not log in one over epsilon. It's going like one over epsilon. Right. That's oh, why no. we need the compression. Oh no. Yes. Yeah. It's so linear. So linear. I mean, you can't do any yeah. kind of any kind of floating point scheme, I mean, you see what I'm saying here. Yeah, yeah, so, so it turns out that the compression scheme doesn't really work with flow, with, uh, well, we, we wouldn't really need floating point anyway, okay. but if you had sort of a binary yeah. expansion, right. then you would need things which were self-inverse, but with different weightings, and then we have a compression scheme which doesn't really work in that scenario, and one, one of the things we're thinking of is... All over the place, sorry? In, that, in the case I was proposing, it'd have to be all over the place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so now get into the Trotter expansion. So we are... So now, now just for illustrative purposes, I'm just assuming we've broken this up into a sum of two Hamiltonians, which are then going to be self-inverse, or proportional to self-inverse. So... In general, we're going to have a time-dependent evolution for um, the, for a, the, um, the expressing our the, um, evolution of our quantum state, and this t is just script t is just indicating a time-ordering operator, which you don't really have to worry about. But you can think of that as breaking up the time into a large number of small time intervals, where you have evolution under one Hamiltonian under that short time at one t time tj and evolution under the other Hamiltonian. And then in the trotterization, you're basically taking a finite value of r. So then the error is then scaling like, so this, in the time dependent case, this is going to be a um, maximum of the norm of h and the norm of h prime uh, it's going to be a maximum of that times the t squared over r. So we would think of that, well, we, we'd think of doing this, first of all, on our uh, decomposition into one sparse Hamiltonians and then, the, um, the, and then the have a further decomposition into the self-inverse. So the idea of bounding the complexity then is the complexity is basically proportional to this r, so if you want to have error no larger than epsilon, you just swap around an epsilon and an r and have that the r is proportional to lambda t squared over epsilon. So this is what gives you a 1 over epsilon scaling for standard trotterization and also a t squared scaling. So now the next trick is that when we're looking at things which are self-inverse, then we want to... Um, the, then if it's, say, epsilon h times u1, then this evolution, is, oh, I've missed out an identity here. It should be cos theta times an identity minus an i u1 times sine theta. So the, the, um, the thing is that when it, this u1 is self-inverse, you always get an expression like this, and you don't get a higher powers of u1, because u1 squared is just gets you back to the identity. And this thing you can implement probabilistically using a control qubit. So what you want to do is set a control qubit in a superposition of 0 and 1, then have a control on that to do your U1 on your target state, and then if you have a projective measurement, which is essentially projecting onto um, with that bra, you're going to get this final state with that evolution under that operator. And if you're looking at having a delta t which is small, then this theta, the theta is actually epsilon h times a delta t, and we're wanting to have epsilon h really small, which means that this state is very close to zero, this state is very close to zero, and we have an overall failure probability which is just going like epsilon h delta t. So if we just have one of these, then it, it, the, um, the, 
almost always works. So to turn things into a, a form which I'm going to be using for the larger scheme, instead of starting with this, you can think of starting with a zero and then having a rotation, which is uh, rotating it into um, the, uh, and putting those real parts on with the rotation matrix and then have a P which is just putting a, the phase part on so, it, so that we get this state here. And similarly, you can have a rotation and have the final detection in the zero state. Are those so wonderful circuits, are they listed in, in that paper? Uh, yeah, yeah, so it essentially, it, it doesn't actually give these one, <laughs> one control qubit circuits, it gives things sort of, you know, for the more, it, actually I'm not, I'm not sure now, I, I, I don't remember exactly which figures were in that paper, but it does explain things in detail in that paper. Can we go previous yeah. slide? Uh -huh. So you measure 0 or 1? Which is good for you? Sorry? Oh, it's, it, you measure it as a superposition of 0 and 1. Mm -hmm. So to think of it in terms of measuring the 0 and 1 basis, you have to put that rotation on it first. Mm -hmm. Yep. But you can... So you say it's forced, you will get that measurement all the time. Yeah, well if you're post-selecting, then you get that measurement result, but you can't really post-select. We have to think of what's also going to happen if that fails and right. how to go back and correct if that fails. So what, what is the probability that you get one? That is going like epsilon h delta t. Okay. So the idea is that we're making both of these small and we have an overall probability of success which is reasonably good. And, and if you get one, then what? And you just throw it out? Or what do you no, do? no, because we're going to have to do a sequence of these which means we have to do a simulation which is basically reversing the thing and if we have a failure we actually get like a root a square root of u1 here and that's, oh, that's something very that's something which we can correct deterministically okay so we can it's actually actually quite a complicated procedure because you have to go back through the entire thing and correcting and then the you have a like, probability of a quarter of your correction failing in which case you have to correct again but you overall have a it's like a random walk except you have a very strong weighting of going towards a success the self -inverse is important. yeah yeah that's another area where the self inverse is important and we've actually been looking at sort of other scenarios which um, the, which could potentially make things nicer in other ways but then the correction operations we don't really know how to do so uh, so that's why we go with this approach. Okay, so now, as I was saying before, we're looking at an overall total time of t that we're wanting to simulate over, and we would be thinking of using a trotter decomposition over that entire time, but then breaking up the time into intervals of length one quarter, and it's one quarter in this original paper, but it's going to be something slightly smaller in our scenario. And so then we, call it M for the number of trotter intervals which we're using in this time period of length one quarter. So then when we do that, the probability of success for the using that controlled operation multiple times is going to be at least three quarters, which means that we, with, we have a good probability of success and if we don't have a success then we have a good probability of um, correction. Okay, so now this is illustrating what happens if we have many controlled operations. So we're thinking of having basically each of these is what I was showing before, except I've thrown out the P's for simplicity. So in a trotterization, you wouldn't have a U2, U1, U2, U1, U2, U1, etc. They are all interleaved together. And then the, um, we have each of these um, each of these controls on different qubits. So then if we look at what's happening at the beginning here, these are all very tiny rotations. So this was a rotation like this where the alpha is approximately equal to 1 and the b is going like a 1 over root m. And the m was the number of these things, in the, which is 16 in this diagram. So then if 
you're looking at the state here, it's like this tense at m times, and this is like Bernoulli trials in a superposition. And what it's going to give you, because when the more betas, this is essentially got weighting that's going down exponentially in the, so this norm of x, which I've illustrated here, this x is a bit string and the norm of x is the number of ones in this bit string. So the, essentially the probability here is going down exponentially in the number of ones. So typically you're getting strings like this where you have lots and lots of zeros and only a few ones. And so you can think of what the positions of each of those ones are. Now, what I'm illustrating here is this is actually a multiple controlled operation on all of these qubits. And it's going, looking at all of those qubits and working out where the first one is. And so if you remember before, I was alternating U2, U1, U2, U1, U2, U1, etc. So what that's telling you is that if the, the uh, first one is even, you should be do in an even position, you should be doing a U1. If it's an odd position, you should be doing a U2. So what these controlled operations are doing is essentially just looking at the parity of these control, of the position of the, of the one in the control qubits and doing a U2 or a U1 based on that. And so that's what that big vertical oval is. is yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then the, there's also a third alternative, which is that it's run off the end and there's no more ones in that, in that um, bit string in the superposition. And in that case, it just does the identity. Okay, so as I was saying before, you have the strongest weighting on having the smallest number of ones. So what I've indicated here does the whole thing, except these ones out here are almost never going to get done. So what you can do is look at, uh, is identify these later ones, which are never going to be, be um, they are almost never going to be done and omit them. And the overall circuit is still going to be accurate, accurate within the error that you need provided the, the, K, the, the, the K I'm going to use here is the number of these that I retain. Provided you choose that appropriately with epsilon, you get, still have the overall error of the procedure properly bounded. Okay, so now I'm just rearranging things to make it a little bit neater for the following slides. Uh, so now what we're doing is we're replacing those long forms of the control qubits with the compressed form. So what we're doing is like is we're having different registers which are just storing the positions of the ones. So we'd have a P1 up to P which is the number of ones in the string and then since we have a fixed number of registers we just have to pad out with some, um, we, there's something we would just make it an M um, to pick something definite. Now, see people pulling terrible faces there. <laughs> So it's a, it's a very simple compression technique, but then when you get to do the measurement, then it gets a little bit more difficult. So essentially what we have is we have a, a um, so this is indicating the compressed form of the uh, control qubits. So this three up here is the position of the first one, this is the position of the second one, this is the position of the third one. So actually what well, that's these, now. yeah, yeah, this is encoded. So actually this, control is actually only being, con being controlled on these, this one's only being controlled on these, and this one's only being controlled on these. So, um, so first of all, there's a question of how to do this preparation here, and second is how to do the uh, final operation. So if you remember before, we had all of these R's on this ER state. So to do the V on this, we can use something like this. So um, essentially what we have is one qubit, which is a control qubit, which we have a rotation on, and then we have a whole lot of controlled rotations on the remaining qubits, which can give us essentially almost exactly what the state is we want, except we have some extra cleanup steps to fix those padding. So if you remember, there's these padding qubits here, and we need some extra cleanup steps to fix those, but otherwise it's, um, it's fairly straightforward. And you also need to, so this is going to give you relative positions between the ones, and you also need to do some operations to get absolute positions of the ones. 
which is what you need for these controls. So, so what's in the oval and what's in the V, right? Oh, so this, sorry. All, this is all V. That thing yeah, there. yeah. This is this. What this is indicating is all V, so that we can, we can so use this V to get absolute positions of the ones that these use. Yeah. So, so what do those ovals have in them? The tall mm -hmm. ovals. What do the tall ovals have in them? There? Okay. So this one is just actually controlled on the top three. This one's only controlled on the. So what it says is if all three of them are one, then. No, 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 no. The, the, these qubits here are encoding a position, so it's right, like. Right, right. It's like um, the, it's it's just the, um, in the the three qubits encoding the position of where one was in the previous thing. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I understand, but but I mean, if that if that thing has one wire coming out of it determining whether to apply UI or not. Yeah. Right. Then you have to detect identity with. I mean. That UI, the I has to line up with the I on that first set of three wires, and so, right, so, mm -hmm. as I varies, the, the, that unitary down at the bottom, UI will change, right? Yep, yep, that's right. Right? So, I guess, so what you're saying is that the, the three I values are somehow, I mean, I don't understand how UI varies with I, I guess, is what I'm saying. Oh, well... It's just looking to see if this one's odd or even for this controlled operation. This one's checking if this one's odd or even, and so forth. And I guess with when you've only got two there, you'd only be needing to. Um, it, well, I guess you're needing to check two things. You need to check whether it's odd or even, or it's in the M state, which is indicating that there's no more ones. So other than that, it's just a normal uh, control operation which you can do relatively easily but it sounds to me like the question was what allowed you to neglect yeah I had the same question right the rest to, to, to neglect what sorry so I, I guess you're right you lost you, uh, you lost me anyway on, on exactly how these controls are working and why you can eliminate you all, mean all the this first set thing. back here well, it's it's got got yeah, yeah so yeah. it's not ah Okay, so it's the idea the is that this one is control of the position of the first one, but if there's no ones at all in there, you just do nothing. Okay. Then this one's controlled on the position of the second one, but if there's no more than one one, you don't do anything there. And so if you go up to here, um, you only do this one if it's all ones, which happens with a ridiculously small probability. So all of... I see. Basically, all of the ones you're throwing away are the ones that are only happening with very, very tiny probability. Okay, so... Okay, so these control functions are quite complicated. But, uh, yeah, yeah, they're relatively complicated, but they have, have um, date, gate decompositions, which I won't go into here. Just statistically, there's only so many, many ones. Yes, yes. Let's say, not, rarely more than K. Yeah, when yeah. you okay, you can ignore. Yeah, so as I was saying, that K is selected so that the error from discarding those strings small. with higher hemming weight is very small. Okay, so then we were talking about how to make that state. So the details of that aren't so important because what I'm going to look at is how to do this measurement, which is kind of tricky. Because ideally, what we're wanting to do is take these compressed qubits and decompress them and do a whole lot of these R rotations. And as I was saying before, we want to have measurement results of zero on everything, but we've got a probability of a quarter of having some measurement results of one. So if we do have a failure, we need to work out where that failure is or we can't correct it. So we have to be able to work out where the positions of the ones are on that measurement in the uncompressed basis, but typically there's only going to be a small number of ones. So when you get this measurement result, it's actually something which you could compress back down again. So if you think of ideally what we'd want to be doing is to start with a compressed basis, uncompressed, do the Rs, do the measurement, and then compress back down again. But we're going to a, from a compressed basis to a compressed basis. So surely we have some way of going from one to the other without expanding out to an inefficient number of qubits. So... Very large. I mean, right? I mean, the, 
expansion could be really big. Yeah, yeah. Because what, what we're uh, eventually doing is taking our trotterization, which is the, um, putting like a factor of epsilon in there from the trotterization, and then we're getting another factor of epsilon because we're breaking up each of the individual Hamiltonians into t these tiny parts which are going to be proportional to self-inverse. So then, if, then that number of things is like going to be the number of control qubits we have, which is going to be huge. So we don't want to be doing things in that, in that uncompressed basis. Okay, so, yeah, our, so the reason why I was going back to this slide was because we're thinking of having things in a, a, um, a, in a compressed form of zero originally, and then doing a V operation, which is taking us to the state we want. And then if we had the state we wanted here and inverted this operation, we'd get all zeros and measuring would be giving us all zeros. But when, because we have these control operations here, we've actually changed this state because it's now entangled with this thing. So, um, but if we still actually were lucky and got the all zeros measurement, we would have performed the correct measurement that we wanted. So we do know how to do a measurement that succeeds. But as I was saying, we don't always have a measurement that succeeds. If it doesn't succeed, we need to know where it's failed. So, the, um, the, so to explain this, first of all, what we can look at is it's, it's doing a partially non-destructive measurement. So we're thinking of instead of just measuring in the compressed basis, um, what all of these individual bit values are. We can say we're going to measure it as all zeros or everything that's orthogonal to all zeros. So it's something in this plane here. And you can think of doing it with this type of controlled operation here. So this is just some extra ancilla in a state one. And if all of these things are all zeros, then th that flips this to a zero and you'll measure a zero here. Whereas if anything is a one here, it, oh sorry, um, no, no, that, that's that's right, yeah, yeah. So, so, and then if the, uh, then if anything is a one here, this doesn't get flipped and it comes out as a one, yeah. So, now in the following diagrams, it's going to be shown by this oblong here, and so we have a recursive measurement which we want to do, which looks something like this. So we're essentially taking the entire thing and doing this projective measurement between all zeros and everything orthogonal here. And if you assume that you find it's not, you then divide it into two and so, you're keeping so on doing it like this. Additional on the first one not succeeding? Yeah, yeah. So if it does succeed, you don't it's go any like further. The that controls yeah, the so, so like the, the, the way it's happening here is it's going to a one here and a one here. So at this stage, you've found at least one one then here you're finding that you have a, a, at least one one in this half, yep. which is, ends up being this one. This one you find at least one one in this half, which turns out to be this one. And then at this stage, this one finds all zeros. So these are all greyed out because you don't actually need to do any further operations. And similarly there, and in this way, you end up finding all your ones without having to go out of a fully compressed basis. And what you find is that the complexity of this, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the number of measurements, you st the steps that you need if you're actually finding uh, k ones out here is going like k times log m. So essentially log m is the number of times you have to divide in two and you have k for the, uh, the having to find that one and having to find that one. So essentially it's still efficient because you don't have anything that's going linearly in, in M there. So how am I going for time? So I have a bit more explanation of how this goes, which perhaps isn't so illuminating. Um, so we have to be thinking about th thinking about uh, having to actually do things not just in that original basis, we have to do that operation which is inverting that preparation and then we are redoing it after the measurement and then we have to break things up 
oh, the, the, uh, then we have to have an operation which is breaking up the compression into the two halves. But I'll just skip over that. So just bringing all of these details together, what we end up doing is dividing. So after yep. about k steps, you're ready to make a correction. And then oh, you, you do oh, make well, 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 if, you th if you're thinking of what happens, after all of those measurements, you, all you've done is located the value yeah, and the exactly. positions of the errors. And, therefore you and can then you have to go back and make a compression. Sorry, sorry, a correction. But the correction is basically as difficult as doing the simulation in the first place. You've got to run the simulation backwards. Yeah, you've got to run it backwards and, and put corrections for those individual errors and in that backwards forward. simulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and how many rounds is that? Uh, it goes. Uh, if you, it goes according to laws of probabilities for random walks, <laughs> so you have an exponentially small error of needing more than some fixed number of of iterations of the walk. That's where the random walks are. Right. So, so when you go to yeah. like to fully quantify the complexity, you have to look at sort of how many errors it's having to correct and how many steps it's having to go backwards to actually do the full correction and. The, the length of the, the walk and so forth. But it all turns out that since it's so heavily biased towards success, that everything uh, is nicely bounded. Okay, so this is the, uh, where we bring, bring all of these parts together. So we ha had, uh, first of all, a division of the Hamiltonian into this number of parts. So we originally had a d squared or a 6d squared for the original decomposition, and we just throw away the 6 for the order scaling, and then we have a norm of h on epsilon h to get accuracy epsilon h for this approximation. And that's just because, um, and I, I actually put a max norm of h in here for the paper because essentially you're just looking at the maximum absolute value of an entry in the matrix and then you might need to break that up into order a, um, a max norm of h parts to get down to order one, and then another one on epsilon h parts to get down to size epsilon h. So then we are actually, if you remember before I said we were using time segments of length one quarter, and the idea of the time segments in the original um, 2009 paper was to get probability of success of three quarters. Now, we actually need to subdivide it into the parts of length proportional to one on m times epsilon h, and we have the uh, order this number of parts. Now, it might seem nasty that it has a one on epsilon h there, um, but it comes in the product m times epsilon h, and m it was divided by epsilon h in the first place. So that actually gets rid of a factor of epsilon h, which is something that we need because the, um, so we have this number of segments. And essentially what the scaling is coming from is that we have this number of segments and each of these segments we can do with complexity that's essentially polylog and all the other things. So then when we look at the overall complexity, we get this thing coming down here times the poly log factor and this poly log factor is coming from that compression and then just multiplying this m times the epsilon h gives us a d squared norm of h which is coming here and then the time just comes down there. So that's where our overall scaling for the algorithm comes together, it comes from. Okay, so that was part one for that simulation, this is part two, which is, the, um, the, which is just as easy. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is using quantum walks for simulation, which is strictly linear in the evolution time. Uh, so there's three ingredients to this. Uh, one of these is what's called the Zegedy quantum walk. So the, um, so I'll need to explain a bit about what quantum walks are first, I think. And then we use a coherent phase estimation, which is a bit like a Kitaev phase estimation. And then we also need to use a controlled state preparation. 
So the general idea is that this quantum walk, it's, it's going to be essentially operating on the state in some expanded space and it, quantum walk is going to have eigenvalues and eigenvectors which are related to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. So we, there's a general procedure where if you have one operation which you can do and another operation which you want to do and the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are related in a nice way, you can do phase estimation to work out what the eigenvalues are and then artificially put on the eigenvalues that you want for the state for the operation that you want to perform. So quantum walk is a unitary transformation? Yeah, yeah. So um, I sh you should have the slides if I've uh, uh, explaining this in more detail. So the normal quantum walk you have what you call a position oper a, a position um, subsystem and a coin subsystem. So essentially the coin is just a qubit and the position is like some, the, um, like integers. So you, if, you, if you think of what a walk is doing, you, you actually have a coin flip operator which would be like a Hadamard and then the, um, the, and then so, so essentially if you're starting on a plus or minus one, you're getting a plus or minus in this thing and that coin operator isn't affecting the x. And then the step operator is looking at the value of the coin and it's doing a plus one or a minus one on the position depending on the value of the coin. So if you think of what's what that's doing, you can start in the zero position and if you just had a classical walk, you'd randomly do a step from to the left or the right and you'd get essentially a um, a, a Gaussian distribution the, approximately and the width of that is going out like the square root of the number of steps but when you do a quantum walk you have actually amplitudes for going out to a distance which is linear in the number of steps and sort of this was sort of an original motivation that people had for thinking that quantum walks might give you computational speed ups and there was some um, very clever work with sort of doing quantum walks on more complicated graphs rather than just in lines which give interesting speed ups but I won't go into that. Uh, what we're using is what's called a Zegedy quantum walk which uses um, more general operations it should we call um, controlled diffusion operations. So to explain what these are doing these are a rather strange thing. This, so I'm not, not sure if you'd be familiar with this type of thing. This is essentially giving you a um, reflection. And <coughs> these are controlled reflections. And the first is controlled by the fir first register and acts on the second register. So before we had a position and a coin register. And now we have two registers which are basically symmetric between each other. And the second one is essentially the opposite of this. It's controlled on the second register and acts on the, and acts on the first register. So then what these are doing is, so the C you take some general matrix Cij and you have these states which are expressed in terms of the square roots of the entries of that matrix. And then what this C is, is that's a, a, um, a, a projector on I on the first system and this, it's a state CI on the second system. So it's like a, a controlled state preparation. So then what happens when you construct this thing is that, so the, uh, essentially what it does is it takes, it, it, this operation is looking at the value of I on the first register and based on that register it reflects around CI in the second register. Okay, so then the, uh, we have a similar definition for the, for the R and the quantum walk is just alternately doing these two steps. So what we want to do is look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this step operator and it turns out that those eigenvalues and eigenvectors are related to a matrix which you can form from the C matrix and the R matrix. 
So the idea now is to use a symmetric system. So the dimensions of the, the, um, of the two things are the same. And these C and R's are just the complex conjugate of the entries of the Hamiltonian. Now, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the walk are going to be related to those of the Hamiltonian, which I the, um, we don't think I've given the formula for just because it's not very illustrative, but, um, but it, uh, the thing which is fairly important for this is we need to modify this state preparation. So you remember before we had this state preparation to this state, so remember this was then going to be complex conjugate of Hij. So if we had just did the same thing, we'd just be having this part but that wouldn't actually be a normalised state with this Hamiltonian. So you can think of putting this multiplying factor in, and if you just so 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 this this if you just ignore this delta for the moment, if you have a one on the one no, uh, um, actually a, it, um, yeah, I think you'd actually have to have a one on root sigma i there to make sure that that thing's normalised. But then the sigma i's are dependent on the value of i, which would mean that you'd have to have a i-dependent thing out here, which is not what you want. You want to have um, just a constant here. So to make sure that the entire thing is normalised, you have to have this extra part out here. And then you have an overall superposition, which is just the, um, controlled by those matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. And there's a couple of difficulties here, which is that, well, this sigma i is not something which we know how to calculate. And the, um, the, well, that's the, the main difficulty. And another thing which you'll notice here is I've put in a delta there rather than a one. And the reason is that we can make this delta small if we make this delta small, then this thing becomes small and it's mostly weight on a single state. And this means that when we do a step of the quantum walk, it's actually very close to the, is quite close to the identity. And this might seem like a counterproductive thing to do, but it turns out to make things quite nice. So we call this the, the laziness parameter. <laughs> so and as I was saying, this thing's unknown, which is a problem. And so the three-step process we have for this Segedy quantum walk approach, so this is due to Andrew Childs back in 2009, is to start with the state in one of the subsystems. So this is the state we want to simulate the Hamiltonian on and perform controlled state preparation so that we have a joint state across both registers. Now we have this Zegedy quantum walk, which we can then do over these uh, two registers. And then that approximates the Hamiltonian evolution. And then at the end, you can invert the controlled state preparation, which it gives you an approximation of the desired final state in just one of the registers. And the idea in step two is that you can do it with that small delta, that um, that laziness parameter, and you can essentially just do things as in that um, as in that procedure. But you can also use this phase estimation approach, which I was mentioning before. It's more of an equalness parameter than laziness, because you want it small. A, a, a what parameter? To, to eagerness. 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 Because when it's small, it's lazy. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess so. Um, I, I, I seem to remember as a, a draft we called it an unlaziness parameter or something. <laughs> okay, so because that's because Andrew was using the previous walk, walk which was defined by Segedy, but Segedy didn't use it for Hamiltonian simulation. And Andrew's Between idea was to ranking and other things equivalents with, with coins for, for the walks. So uh, people built the page rank stuff on top of that, various other things. Oh, okay. Yeah. We have that up and running, actually. Um, so now this is explaining how this simulation by phase estimation works. So this is for sort of a general, very general procedure where you want to implement 
one unit tree, uh, where you can implement a unit tree V, which in this case would be the step of the walk, but you want to implement a different operation O. And in our case, this O is still a unit tree, but you can also think of doing this for non-unit tree things, which is um, the, what, what, for example, the Harrow, Hassanim and Lloyd um, linear systems work does. So now the idea is if these operations share eigenstates, but the eigenvalues are related by a function, then this is something very useful. So here you say, get an e to the i lambda where the lambdas are real for eigenvalues of this v, and then you want to put in an f of lambda here. Now you can implement this unitary v many times and perform phase estimation in a coherent way just by using a, a Kitaev style phase estimation. And then what that gives you is this psi gives, then has an extra register where you put an estimate of, the, um, of this lambda which you're using to index these eigenvalues and eigenstates. So then what you can, and, and this um, psi lambda is just the individual weightings in the original state. And then you, your f of lambda is something which can be imposed and if this is a unit tree, then the f of lambda is just a phase factor, which you can do deterministically. And you can do non-unitary things if you are allowing yourself some probability of error as well. So, the, um, and you have a little bit of difficulty because this isn't necessarily an exact estimate, so you have some error due to that. But ignoring that, all you're getting is, you're getting this f of lambda factor in the superposition so then when you invert the phase estimation, you wipe out that thing and just get this. And this is what you'd want if you were just performing the operation O on your initial state. Okay. So in our case, what the V is, is it's the step of the walk and the O is the evolution under a, for some time. And the idea, okay, so this is where I give the, the um, eigenvalues. So the, if you have an eigenvalue mu for the Hamiltonian, then the step of the quantum walk has eigenvalues like this. So you actually get a plus or minus e to the plus or minus i arc sine mu delta. And the operation O would be evolution of the Hamiltonian, so you want to actually put those eigenvalues in there. And you can, um, it's a little bit more complicated than the case I just explained because you also have these plus or minuses. So a single eigenvector for the Hamiltonian goes to actually two eigenvectors for the uh, step of the quantum warp. But you can actually work out which one it is and it doesn't really affect the analysis much. So we have a range of new advances. So um, some of these are going beyond just Hamiltonian simulation. So what we do is actually combine the lazy quantum walk with phase estimation, which improves the efficiency. And we also have a procedure to achieve the controlled state preparation. And we can then combine that with trotterization. And we, that is what would give you the root D scaling. And another thing we can, we've looked at is applying this to unitary operations, which is quite interesting because if you look at a non-sparse case, you can actually apply this to non-sparse cases as well. You can say, um, if you're given a dimension n unitary, then it's got n by n, n times n entries in there. And normally, if you're doing a decomposition of this thing into gates, then you're going to need complexity at least n squared there to do your operation. But if you think in this oracle type of formalism, where you're given, it, where you they ask for a value of the unit tree in a, some location and you have the, um, the oracle can give you that and that's the, just representing some calculation you can do, then you can Im implement that unit tree with complexity root n in most cases, which is kind of surprising. And that's where it, that result I mentioned before, where we can only prove routine in typical cases and not in possibly the, um, the, the um, extreme cases which give us the, um, problems. So 
Oh, I've got 10 minutes left there, I think, so I won't explain everything, but I'll it, just explain uh, part of it. So we have steps of the quantum warp giving us eigenvalues like this. So if we're thinking of mu delta being a rotation on the circle, then we have um, actual rotations giving the actual eigenvalues given to us by the quantum warp, which are going like arc sine mu delta here and a pi minus arc sine mu delta here. And if you remember before, we had a little bit of problem between these plus and minus, but because these things are so far apart and this delta is small, then these things we can very easily distinguish. So then if you were the, um, using, so, so if, if we were just using a lazy quantum walk, then we could basically just say that the arc sign was close to linear and approximate the arc sign by mu, the, um, the, of mu delta by mu delta, which is just approximating this thing by this thing here, which is uh, quite close. And that's what happens in the lazy quantum walk. And then the la error in your lazy quantum walk is just proportional to the nonlinearity in that arc sign. But if you also use phase estimation, you can get an approximation of that mu delta and just use that to work out an approximation of that correction you want there. And because that's a small thing in the first place and it has a small error, that gives you a, a quite a uh, improvement. And that gives you a better result than just, you, you could alternatively estimate mu delta and then uh, uh, the, uh, well, estimate this from the phase estimation and then do the arcs, uh, do the sign rather to get the mu delta. But if you did that, you'd get um, a, a way worse result than combining your lazy walk and the phase estimation. So the second thing which I mentioned is this idea of, so, so remember what we were wanting to do is essentially controlled reflections. And you can do these controlled reflections if you're able to do a state preparation. Now state preparation this is, this is like state preparation with an oracle. And if you go to a paper back in 2000 by Grover, he looked at this problem and, and the idea is that you're starting with a equal superposition state with some ancilla. And if you rotate the ancilla according to the amplitude for the state, which you can do if you're given an oracle, then you can get an amplitude psi k on the zero here. And if you were able to measure it and get rid of this one component, then you'd have exactly the right weighting for the state you wanted, and that you wanted a, a sum over psi k times k. So you can also um, use amplitude amplification, which gives you a better result. So I won't go into the amplitude amplification because that's a little bit complicated, but the, um, I'll just compare what we have here what we have here is like this, and the state we wanted to prepare was like this. So you remember I was saying we were using a, a um, small value of delta. So this thing is small, um, and then this thing is large. And here as well, this thing is going to be large because that's taking the weight of all the other uh, um, parts of the state the other than the k part. So the, um, and then this thing is essentially corresponding to this thing. And we, um, the insight that we use is essentially that we can take this second term in the Grover preparation to take the role of this laziness term in the laziness, in the lazy quantum walk. And that actually enables us to get um, very efficient um, simulations in terms of the norm of H and T. And it also means that we don't need to know this sigma i. You remember before we have this sigma i here, which we don't know how to, well, we can't efficiently calculate just from an individual entry of the H I, of the Hamiltonian, but we don't have to calculate it because we can just use this approach. So then what we get is we get the, um, actually um, it's, the, um, the, you're going to be looking at the maximum of these two things. So, uh, so what you have here 
is you have a norm of h times t over a root epsilon, and the root epsilon is coming from that improvement in the combining the lazy quantum walk and the phase estimation. Otherwise, it'd be one over epsilon, and you can, if that is actually small, then you have or the sparse, sparseness parameter is large, then you have to look at this thing. So, in this thing, the dependence on epsilon has actually disappeared altogether, apart from having to have this be larger than this, and you have a linear scaling in that in that sparseness parameter. So, that is actually giving us strictly linear scaling in the norm of H and T and um, an improved scaling in the sparseness. So, um, as I was, that, that scaling in the sparseness is even better than the scaling in the sparseness for the compressed approach I was explaining first. So, um, if you do a alternative approach with uh, non-sparse cases, and I think um, actually I've seem to have switched from a lowercase d to a capital D there. <laughs> uh, um, it, it, you can get an alternative bound which actually looks like this, which is kind of a weird expression. But if you think, um, so this is actually worse scaling in the time because it's now to the power of three on two, but you've got a root d factor in there. But the other problem is that you actually don't have just all the same norm in here. You have a product of three different norms of H. Now, if these were just going like the, the spectral norm, which is this one, then you just have the spectral norm of H times T to the power of three over two, and you'd have a nice root D in there. But the problem is that we have a one norm in here, and one norms can be big. And the worst case is that so, so this would be if you had a if you had a the Hamiltonian with all entries which were about the same magnitude, then you would have a one norm of H which would be going like root D times the norm of H. So is that H max of infinity norm of H? That's just taking maximum absolute value of H. So absolute, yes, yeah, infinity infinity yeah, yeah, okay. So um, <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, so... Obviously, infinity is a maximum. Well, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, it's the... It's <laughs> the no, no, it's, 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 it's some, some scripted max because it's a maximum absolute value of an entry. Yeah, That's the way... It. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> right. It's okay. Okay. Not, not because infinity is a maximum. Anyway, no, um, right. it, all, all it really matters is sort of the relations between these things. So, if you think of... Um, the, so, so typically, this H max is going to be smaller than the than the um, the spectral norm, but if you have some row that has a the um, so just assume that the spectral norm is one for simplicity. If you have one row that has a one one in one entry and all the rest zeros, then the H max is going to be equal to the spectral norm. If you have the opposite case, which is that you have all entries which are equal, then this thing is going to be going like root d times the spectral norm. But in that case, the, this norm would be 1 on root d. So in that case, you'd have this product would actually be still be proportional to the spectral norm. And if you had a, the other case where you had 1, 1 and the rest zeros, it would still be proportional to the spectral norm. And in either case, you get this scaling here, scaling like root d. But you can also have a worst case scenario where the one norm is going like the root d times the norm of h, and the max norm is just going like the norm of h as well. And that gives you a d to the three quarters scaling. So, um, so you might ask where that, the, um, the, where that, the, um, improvement in D comes from. So the, uh, so the, now we're just replacing the D with N because we're thinking of the non-sparse case. And the, the first two advances are allowing us to get to root N in many cases, but not all. And the ca cases where that fails are where the non-zero elements are 
uh, no, sorry, the cases where this works are where the non-zero elements are of comparable size. So if you have, say, m of these elements are all about the same size, then the height of these are all going to be about 1 on root m. I've just taken the norm of h to be 1 for simplicity. Uh, sorry, the spectral norm of h to be 1. And in that case, you get that scaling, and this thing turns into something with a root n in there, and you have a norm of h times t to the 3 on 2. Yeah, this, does this occur in practice? Well, if you think of, for example, a, um, a see something which is doing a Fourier transform. So if you're doing, a, a, um, well, if you're encoding a, a unitary in a Hamiltonian, you have a Fourier transform Hamilton, the um, unitary, then it's just going to be like that because you have a, a whole lot of elements of equal size. And if you have something which is one sparse and just has ones in the entries, and that's also going to do the same thing. So, but, so the idea to get better um, simulation is to actually break this thing up into components of equal magnitude. So in this case, you wouldn't really need to break it up, but I'm just indicating, indicating this for, um, indicating this to show you what, um, what you'd do in the general case. So you have an H1 case, which is all the biggest elements, and you have an HL case, which is all the smallest elements, and then you would break it up into a whole lot of intermediate chunks as well. So now the idea is if you're breaking it up into Hamiltonians where the non-zero elements are all about the same magnitude, then you get this uh, proportionality working for each of those Hamiltonians on their own. And then you can join this up in a trotterization, which, and I won't go into the details, but um, I think I'll just skip to the end actually because we're out of time. So, um, so any, anyway, the, the, we, with that approach, which I was just explaining, we can essentially get things down to root n in most cases, but there are certain pathological cases where you can break things up into, break the Hamiltonian up into components with about equal sizes, and you are going to get the one norm blowing up and becoming much larger. And when we do simulations, we find that that basically never happens, but you can construct very artificial examples where it does happen. Anyway, so the conclusions of the overall talk is, this is the conclusions for the first part, is essentially that the first scheme gives us Hamiltonian simulation with this type of complexity, where we have a d squared norm of h and t and rest polylog, and which is providing polylog scaling in both the error and the derivative of the Hamiltonian, which is quite nice. And then the quantum walk approach gives us even better scaling in the d and the h and the t, though it's going to give us worse scaling in the epsilon. And you can also have a trade-off to have better scaling in some quantities and worse scaling in the epsilon. So anyway, that's the end of the talk, so thank you. I'll talk to you later. I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't understand why you're penalizing yourself for the fast decomposition algorithm. Then it's why you have d squared in there. We can talk about it. I mean, oh, that's just because you have to break the, the, yeah, in, in know, here, yeah. To, yeah. Yeah, well, you have to break it up into d squared parts in the first place. Well, but you could break it up into d parts with more work. Yeah, but the, that would require actually going through by hand and you don't have any... Well, you have to go through by hand. There actually is an algorithm to do it, but... But, but is but it an the, algorithm that you the can question do is, do, do should, you, should you have to count the complexity of the decomposition algorithm? That's my question. You do. Okay. <laughs> if I just give you the Hamiltonian in that form, or I do it classically... Yeah. I mean, it's a classical algorithm. Um, okay, so if so you... Anyway, yeah, yeah, so if, if, you, if, you, if you sort of have to... To break it up, you have to sort of seek a whole lot of elements of your Hamiltonian, and that's putting a multiplying factor on your complexity already. So, if you count it, yeah, yeah. If I gave you the Hamiltonian, in, if, if you uh, gave me the Hamiltonian four. in a 
already in a sum of deep parts. Suppose I gave you two you in a one sparse form. Yeah. Yeah, or if it was in a one sparse form. Yeah. But we don't want to be having to rely on one sparse in general. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. So the sort of the motivation for this is doing things like if for example we want to simulate some sparse sparse system of linear equations and the, um, and the, uh, how to solve that, or if we have some other algorithm. I was like once involved in a computer project that could only dereference permutations in memory. Okay. Uh, essentially, it, it was re required one sparse loads. Uh -huh. It was an array machine. It, would yep. it could fetch a whole array at once, but it had yep. to be a permutation of the rows and columns. It had to be one sparse. Hmm. And uh, it was very fast if you could guarantee that. And you can. So. Okay. Any other questions to Dominic? Uh -huh. Did anyone understand the second part of the talk? Good. <laughs> yeah, I've I've implemented no, spaghetti. No. Sorry? So I've implemented spaghetti. So oh, okay. So yeah. I'm familiar with the work. Good. But, uh, I was a little, little bit worried that the question sort of petered out at the well, end. Well, the, the problem is it's not it's not a random walk, it's a quantum walk. Which yeah, means it's deterministic, which means that you have to start in a fairly good overlap of the final state you're looking for at the preparation level to actually ever get there. Okay. And the so, problem is the preparation doesn't guarantee you will ever get to the answer you're actually looking for, even though you're in a reasonable preparation, yeah. unless you, you know. Now, one way is to adiabatically evolve the preparation into something that at least has a 50% overlap at the final state, and then uh -huh. you can use the techniques for walking. Oh, okay. It's an alternative technique called quantum stochastic walks mm -hmm. that supposedly fixes this by adding noise, really. <laughs> and so you really are doing a random walk at that yeah, point. So but I haven't implemented it or read the papers well enough to know if, how well it works. Okay. It's going to work worse in terms so, of so the it's average It sounds time. like a totally different application to this, though. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the problem with most of the quantum walk papers. When you start, for instance, the page rank ones that were done, yeah. if you do a big enough graph, you'll never get the right answers. Because you can't prepare them. Because you can't prepare it close <laughs> enough. The small graphs all work because they're all yeah. overlapping with the final states anyway. Okay. And so the same problem also with quantum chemistry, is unless you know how to prepare the initial state to be close to a, a ground state, you never find the ground state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, if you know the answer, you can get the answer. Well, that doesn't help much. So, yeah, a lot of this has that problem. Not your stuff. I'm talking about the, the underlying approaches. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of problems. Speeding them up is a good thing, but we also need to prepare better. It's mm -hmm. part of the problem. Yeah. So, in general, you use this for the, like, the application of the Hamiltonian simulation and the parallel Well, that's one application. Another application is if you're looking at the work on NAND tree simulation. Mm -hmm. So you have a method for doing NAND tree simulation, which is basically doing evolution under Hamiltonian. And if you do that simulation of evolution under Hamiltonian using a, um, using a Hamiltonian simulation approach, you basically can turn it into discrete queries. Whereas if it's just a continuous Hamiltonian simulation, it's really requiring that are continuous queries to an oracle, which isn't a, uh, isn't really so realistic. And uh, and also, if you're thinking of say trying to simulate differential equations on a quantum computer, which you can put on top of the Harry-Hessian and Lloyd approach. Any more questions? Thank you, Dominic, for your time. Let's. <laughs>